Again, I welcome you today to the very heart of the Lord, the lawgiver and the gracious God. I really want us to look in today's book today to contemplate the grace of God. Last week, we talked about the nation of Israel, the way they had departed from the plan of their lawgiver. And I want us to really think about today what the point of the law is. But before then, let us pray. Father, we are so grateful to you because when we know you and we know your heart, we find the blessings that you have for us. We are on top of your love in all the creation, you called us so that we can live to glorify your name. As you invite us today again, Father, we pray, help us to contemplate what the heart of our Heavenly Father is, even as we live in this world. Glory be to your name, in Jesus' name, amen. I want us to begin by looking into what we did discuss last week. The Moabites, they were banished from entering the congregation of Israel. <clears throat> the law forbids an equal yoke with unbelievers in business, in marriage. What is the point of the law? What I want us to see here is that the law never, never, depart from showing us God's call upon our lives. The law is set to show us where we have erred, where we have moved away, so that we may seek forgiveness and reconciliation with God. The law was not given to save anyone. Rather, it was given to show us the way to God. The point of the law was to show us our inadequacies so that we may seek God. Keeping the law will not save anyone. What saves us is the grace of God. The scripture tells us that this grace was fully revealed in Jesus Christ. You look at Titus chapter 2 verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. This was the point of the law, even in the Old Testament. David said, blessed is the man to whom God imputes not iniquity. The Bible told us that Abraham was saved because he believed in God, not by works, it is by grace. Jesus Christ is God's grace that appears to all men. The goal of the law is to point us to Jesus Christ. And the message of the law is that all have sinned, both Jews and Gentiles. God brought out a people for himself, that is the Jews, and these people, they were redeemed by his grace, not by their works. God set them apart so that they could become his own weaknesses to the nations of the world. Now you look at Elimelech's journey to Moab and his son's marriage to the Moabites. Even those, though the, those uh, violates the law of Moses, but these actions are not entirely unprecedented within the mysterious working activities of God, whose spirit is working to bring all people to salvation. This is what the book of Ruth teaches us. What do I mean? In each of these activities that we see, even though they may violate the law, you see exactly the heart of God calling unto the nations, calling us to himself. That's why I want us to look at Ruth chapter 1 today, and from verses you look exactly at the call of God. I want you to begin to look at that. What is the call of God upon your life? And sometimes it may be within the mysteries of life. The call comes to each and every one of us. Last week, I left you with certain principles. Principle number one, 
Don't leave the source of your spiritual blessings in times of trouble, except the Lord is guiding you to do so and not to move to a place of pharma, a place of, um, of ignorance. God will lead you into a place of blessing spiritually. When Elimelech left the promised land, he never imagined that he will never see the land again. Principle number two, don't fall for the lie of the enemy that you will have enough time to live apart from God and after that you can return to God before you die. Today may be the last day. Principle number three, live a godly life because the way you live will influence your life and your children. No matter how we might look at Elimelech and his children today, the life of Ruth's and the choices that Ruth made convince us that Elimelech's journey and his children's marriage is not outside of the providence of God. We can place their lives in Jesus' parable of the sower. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 3, the Bible says, Then he spoke many things to them in parable, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. The life of Elimelech and his children, what you will notice that it was through their journey that Ruth and Opa had the opportunity to hear the gospel. Both experienced the loss of their husbands, but God was working in the mystery of their pain. Both experienced God's call. With the death of Naomi's husband, Naomi then eventually decided to leave for Israel. Could the point of Elimelech's journey be God's call upon Ruth and Opa? Who knows? The explanation is not outside of God's will because if you look at the life of Jesus Christ, he left the glory of heaven and came down to the earth to call us to God. Elimelech and his son had a tremendous impact on Ruth and Opa. Apparently before death took them, Ruth and Opa had the message of the God of Israel, the one true God. Let's take three things out of this. Number one, God's call upon them to the altar. Look at Ruth chapter 1 and verse 6. Then she arose with her daughter's in-law, as Naomi, that she might return to the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord has visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Naomi was left alone. Husband gone. Children gone. She could not cope with her husband and her children's departure. She decided to return to Israel. She decided to go back even to the land of God. Now, providence is at work here. God had returned to his people, visited them with rain and bread. These people knew that the blessing of the rain comes from above, from God. Much like we should know today, the economy of the world is under God's providence. God blesses, God provides for, God is our supplier. Now Naomi is returning to her God and returning to the land of her blessing. Ruth and Orpah now has to choose whether to return with Naomi or to continue to stay in their land of idolatry. Both of them at the very beginning chose to follow the God of their husbands, the God of Israel. They have had the message. They had confessed their sins of idolatry. They have decided to follow the one true God. The opportunity to prove their faith now has arisen. Can I say something to you, brothers and sisters? Jesus Christ told us, and as you will notice before, when we decide to follow him, when we decide to follow the one true God, there will be a temptation. There will be the time for us to prove and to prove to the world that we really have made the choice from the best and the depth of the conviction of our hearts. If you look at Ruth and Opa here, what you will notice is a time of baptism. 
What does baptism symbolize? Baptism symbolizes our declaration to the world that we are dead to our old world. We are dead to our idolatry. We are dead to the false gods and the false things that, that, that control our life before. Now we are declaring that we have come to the one true God, Christ Jesus our Lord, and that we will live by the grace of God's Spirit, we will live the rest of our life for Him. Here is the test of this conviction, of their confession in verse 8. Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I shall say I have hope, if I shall have a husband tonight and shall also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Could you see the plea of Naomi? It was God himself putting those passionate tearful fear, I mean, a tearing kind of words, emotional words, in the mouths of that woman in order to prove whether Ruth and Orpah's faith actually stand. Naomi persuaded the girls to go back. And if you read the scripture very, very closely, this is not just Naomi's kind of one-time example. You will notice the same kind of example when Elijah was living and Elisha was following, saying, give me the double portion of your anointing. You will notice the same kind of question that Jesus Christ threw even to the 12 disciples when the crowd had left. He said, would you also stand? Wouldn't you go away with them? The persuasion for these two girls to return is based on their immediate natural needs. Naomi wanted them to see fully. What does it mean for you if you come and you say you are following the faith of your fathers, of your husband? He told them there will be the need of a husband. There will be the need for prosperity, a posterity. You need to think about that. You need companion, the need for a more certain future. Are you still going to decide to follow this one true God? Look at the same temptation that was put to Jesus Christ. A very much closer kind of temptation. Turn these stones to bread. Live for your flesh and for the needs of your life alone. There is no need for you to actually follow faith. Naomi kissed the girls. A sign of release. Telling them, I have released you, and I'm blessing you if you choose to go back. The time that they had spent together, the feeling of loss, even for these two girls, made them cry. They wept. But Ruth and Opa lifted up their voices, and they wept. Turn back, Naomi told them, my daughters. I can promise you a future husband. I have no sons in my womb that I would think that they could grow up and they will eventually get married to you. Turn back. Go back to your idolatry. He told them. And he said, I will be severely distraught if my actions restrain, restrains you from having a future, from having your posterity. I am truly concerned about your future. I promise, my brothers and sisters, this is a strong temptation. The temptation for us to turn butter to bread is very strong. It is only those whose faith falls on the good ground and they are taking deep root that they will pass the temptation. What is going on here? Matthew chapter 13, 
from verse 19. Jesus said, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away that which was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Look at how it is playing out in the life of Ruth and Opa here. Point three, the proof of faith. In verse 14, then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Opa kissed her mother-in-law. Opa kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her, and she said, again Naomi was the one talking now, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Do you notice this is one of the most beautiful words that have ever been penned in the history of humankind? A similar thing that Elijah told his uh, master Elijah. And all the crowds that were telling him, go back, go back, God is taking your master away from you today. I tell you, brothers and sisters, look, this is the exact faith that it takes us to say that we are followers of Jesus Christ. I want you to begin to take a look at something. You know, the name Ruth was derived from the Hebrew word Reut, which means friend or companion. That is the faith that never leaves us or we leave it in the time of trouble. The name is a feminine name of Hebrew origin, meaning friendship, compassionate friend. As some commentators has even suggested that we should turn the meaning of that name to grace. Ruth in chapter 1 verse 16 demonstrated the faith of Abraham who gave his own son, the only son that he had lived for in life, back to God. Talks about the faith of Elisha who followed his master Elijah against every constant warning to return to the Lord to return from following his master, Elijah, because God is taking him away. The faith of this woman, Ruth, is as good as the faith of the 12 disciples, who continue to follow the Lord against the Lord's challenges to them, even when the crowd had departed. Faith is not the respecter of sexes. All these examples I have given to you examples of strong men of faith. And here you are looking at a woman of faith. As much as in our contemporary time, like the faith of this man, David Livingstone, who after he had got all his trainings as a medical doctor, called of God to go into the far Africa, and by the grace of God, take the gospel of Christ and even minister to people who had not heard about it. He fought against slavery and he stood by the grace of God and lived in history to be one of those who put an end to it. This is the faith that we are called to. Ruth was a widower. She has lost her husband, but she will not lose her faith. If you are there today, you had lost sons or you had lost daughters. 
or you had lost husbands, your faith can still be as strong as the faith of Ruth. I want you to understand one thing. Your suffering is not an indication that the call of God is not upon your life. Actually, it may even be otherwise. Your cross may be an indication that the call of God upon your life is strengthened. It is sure and it is unmistaken. In the midst of the cross, we can find the trial. But again, in the midst of the cross, we can be able to clarify the calling. This faith is the faith that is worthy. It is the faith that brings us into God's unmerited blessing. All of these that I had mentioned did what they did because they prized the grace of God that appeared unto them above everything else. Ruth said, I've tasted him. I have connections with him. The one and the true God. I will never allow anything to take him out of my life and out of my story. She left her idolatry. She left by the grace of God her people and she followed even the one through God. Do you know what Jesus told us? He said those who left mothers, who left fathers, who left children, who left land, and who left all of these things for my namesake. He said, I will bring it back to them in folds and multiple folds and again it comes with persecution and he said in the eternal life they will sit on the throne of uh, judgment with me and they will be by the grace of god those who exhibit god's judgment upon unbelief here i called you today what are you going through maybe that is god's call upon your life how are you responding to that call? Are you like the sower? What kind of heart do you have? And how can we understand the grace of God, even in time of affliction? The law was meant to point our attention to grace. It was not meant to save. It is grace. And in the midst of all of this tribulation, Grace is beckoning to us, saying, look at the cross. I don't know what you are going through, but grace is calling. And it says, step closer, for your loving Redeemer is by your side. And you will continue to seek how God guided Ruth, and God led her and Naomi. You will notice the law is a revelation of the grace of God. Let us pray. Lord, I pray that wherever we may be and whatever cross we are carrying, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be revealed unto us. May the oil that help to reduce the pain so that we can hear the voice of the Father May it be poured upon everyone. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. God bless you, and I look forward again to seeing you this coming Sunday.